it's, uh, it's a great honor to be here. Let me just give you a warning right away that this presentation may make you feel uncomfortable. The science won't, but some of the other things about the person may. So with that being said, let me just uh, try to tell you a little bit about um, me for a second. I've had a long career at Intel and digital equipment and Silicon Valley startups for some 35 years. I'm basically a business technology person. Uh, and I got into this, and I'll explain a little why, um, just out of general curiosity. Um, uh, my real company is, is Frontline Aerospace, and we do drones and quickly pivoted towards gas turbine efficiency, where we talk about you know, saving 10 to 40% uh, in, in fuel and gas turbines. But that's really not why I'm here. I'm here to talk to you about Joseph Papp and the mystery of the, the noble gas engine. I had some synchronicities that occurred for those people that are familiar with, with that. Uh, back in November of 13, where uh, I was talking to Tom Ballone on the phone, I said, what's the latest uh, interesting uh, over unity thought? And he said, well, you gotta look at the noble gas engine. And so I, then I, I called my dad, who's in the front row, Dr. Bob Wood, and said, have you ever heard of the PAP engine? And he said, well, you know, I was just editing a book by Tompkins, um, and he has a whole chapter about that. And so I, I said, wow, that's interesting. And then I looked up on the web and saw, wow, I found uh, this explosion article that Richard Feynman was at. And then I found the, the Caltech editor who was, who was there. And he did a, a project for a senior project on sunspots. And so did I. So there's all these things that happened in like six hours. I said, OK, that's it. I'm going to dig into this. And so I started to dig into it. You know? So I did what I do. And that sort of be an investigative journalist, be a patent lawyer about this, you know, look at the technology as much as I can. And so I, I sort of dug in and, and tried to, and my conclusion is that this is a very solvable problem right now. Um, this is the quick agenda. We'll talk about Joe Papp, sort of his chronology, some of the data sources that I use, the technical, how does it work, and, and what to do next. Uh, the quick overview of the PAP engine is you, you have, when it's expanded, this is just sort of an internal combustion engine diagram. When it's expanded, you have these noble gases and chlorine in the, in the bottom of, uh, and deoxygenated water um, gas at, at the bottom, and, and two electrolysis pieces. Let's see if I can get the uh, laser pointer. Well, it, it goes on from two electrodes. You're making a little hydrogen. And then, then when it compresses up, there's an electric spark that goes across and it explodes. Uh, the UV light triggers the uh, chlorine and the hydrogen gas, and it explodes very rapidly and back and forth. And that's sort of how it, how it works. Um, so that's the quick overview. I'll delve more deeply into it as, as we go on. But anyway, a quick overview of Pap. He was born in 33 in Hungary. Uh, he got a job at the Academy of Sciences um, in, in Hungary. He, he left Hungary at the revolution, went to Canada, uh, and then went on to the US. Um, the, the first problem with Pap is that he, he came over from Hungary and created this 300 mile per hour submarine, allegedly. And this is a picture of his engine power plant on the right, and he wrote a book about this. And uh, he went from Montreal to Brest uh, over in France in 300 miles per hour and said he did that. Um, and he, he's a great draftsman. He had the skills and drew these fancy pictures of his design and built it. And there's photographs of it and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, he's uh, sort of bipolar wacko. And he really went across the Atlantic in an airplane and hit himself in the head and was floating off a naval uh, base when they picked him up. And he was interrogated by the French Goudumer, which is the FBI at the time, um, and he admits to doing this, but nevertheless, he really had something. Um, and so he, he got a lot of baggage from that and, and left uh, Canada and went to uh, Southern California. And in October of 68, after he just finished filing all his patents, he, he convinced the Naval Undersea Warfare Center in Pasadena at the time to take his uh, sort of noble gas soup that he had created out to the desert and do an explosion. And we'll talk about that. And there was also an explosion at the environmental, environetics parking lot, which I'll talk about. And then general dynamics. Uh, 
it did one. So this is the Canon explosion video, which you can see on the web. Uh, you know, three inch stainless steel, three eighths inch diameter, about a foot of concrete all around. And they take it out to the desert and they videotape it all. And he, he injects um, about 10 cc's of, of gas into each, uh, out of each one of these flasks into the breach. And I've got witnesses that were there and saw him do them. And every time he did it more, his hands started shaking more and more and more. This is according to Cecil Baumgartner, which I'll talk about. So this is a picture. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a little uh, syringe-like metal cylinder there in the pictured. So the UV light doesn't trigger the, the chlorine hydrogen gas that's in there. And, and he plugs it all in, and it goes kaboom, and blows everything to kingdom come. And so I asked one of my Navy SEAL commander friends, you know, how much C4 does that take to blow this up? And he sort of said, well, it's really hard to estimate without, you know, details. But nevertheless, I think 0 .4, 0 0.7 pounds of C4, which is 1.4 megajoules for about 50 cc's of gas. So it's clearly something not uh, chemical. Uh, my quick estimate was, you know, it's 10 to the 12th joules per kilogram. Oh, that's just gigantic energy. Um, it, it considering, you know, and then there's either cluster impact fusion. Anybody ever heard of cluster impact fusion? Nobody. SRI, 1990. This, I think it went classified. But nevertheless, let me talk to you about this other explosion that was in the Environmentics parking lot. This is LA Times article. Uh, PAP had this demonstration with 70 people, including Dr. Richard Feynman of Caltech, who was there. And they set it all up and the engine was running and so forth and then Feynman runs over and pulls the plug out and Pap says, well, you really shouldn't do that. The plug was for some instrumentation that was uh, uh, monitoring things and, and then eventually Pap got more ir irritated and said, well, you really ought to plug that back in. And so he plugged it back in and blows up, kills Jack Edward Hartman, who's a Mattel engineer who was also a friend of, uh, I had another friend who was a Mattel engineer who knew Jack Hartman, another synchronicity. Uh, others were in injured, uh, and Fine was guilty of involuntary manslaughter and settled, settled out of court um, with Caltech. Jack Edward Hartman is an interesting guy. He was, uh, uh, I got his autopsy, and they did a, you know, radiation scan for him uh, two days after his autopsy. Very unusual to have that. That was the actual device that they were using at the time. Um, so Feynman settles out of court. Uh, he writes this article, the skeptical in Skeptical Inquirer. But uh, in general, it's it's his. He believes Pap was a fraud, you know, and it's just his hubris and lack of ability to just step back and and continue to investigate. But nevertheless, Feynman settles out of court. Um, and there's a, a, a lawsuit between Pap and and and. Roser, which is the environmentics guy. And in the legal documents, there's a carve out in the back saying between our agreement that this solid fuel that I invented for my submarine um, is not part of the agreement. And so the question is, how, how the heck, you know, we were talking about these noble gas soups that explode. Um, how is he doing it with the solid fuel too? So one thought is, you know, is this solid hydrogen ionic fuel uh, that works on, there was, that's a possibility. Um, and then I, I got involved, found the, the, the court appointed John Phillips, uh, who was a lawyer at the time, to arbitrate these two back and forth for a couple of years. And he tried really hard to get, he thought there was something very serious and real and important in this engine demonstrations and so forth. And he tried to get these people to work together for a couple of years. And, uh, he's currently the ambassador to Italy right now, um, and he still believes to this day that there's something important here with this after spending a long time talking with all the parties involved. Uh, and he confirmed many aspects of what I've read and researched all about uh, the Joe Papp engine. Um, I, I did an interview with David Ansley, who was a San Jose Mercury News reporter uh, down the road, and he wrote a big article about the PAP engine right out the Pons Fleischmann activity in, in 89. Uh, and he interviewed four different sources and confirmed many aspects of this, this situation. I interviewed Cecil Bumgardner, who's alive today, 
Uh, he was a TRW employee. Uh, he confirmed that the PAP engine was running in a conference room, closed conference room, for hours on end. Uh, he was at the desert explosion. We can, there's a long interview article with him in Infinite Energy. Uh, Bill Tompkins was another interesting fellow. He worked at TRW and managed the PAP project. Eventually, PAP had this explosion and then disappeared and went to TRW and they set him up with a, a classified program. And he quickly, Tompkins, broke the project into two projects, one a bomb project and one a, an engine project. And so they, they married, kept working along the way. Uh, Tompkins confirmed that chlorine gas and this noble gas soup were, were key elements of what's going on. And then one day he came to work and everything was zeroed out of his, his quote, green sheets in his budget. And so uh, he, he was really pissed about this and his boss said, go talk to Cy Ramo, who's the R and TRW. Um, and Ramo said, you know, hey, I had to cancel it. I was asked to, I'm pissed about this too. Uh, I don't think they canceled the bomb project element of it all. I have a good friend who, um, spent his life in the Air Force in nuclear surety and then in private industry worrying about nuclear surety. And I, and I said, Ron, is there anything different or anything between a chemical bomb and a nuke? And he stared at me and just nodded his head. He didn't answer the question, but that's what he did. And so this is an example of something that might be in between the two. Uh, Heinz Klosterman, who's down in Mountain View, raised some money, did some work about this, and, and Rohner and there are RWG, and there's many other people that have done experiments and worked and raised money to try to figure out how this works. But they all fail to get a true power input output test, which is the holy grail of everything. And until you've got that, you don't have anything. So that's been the challenge. I've looked at all sorts of other data sources, and I keep gathering more and more intelligence about what this is going on. Um, and I've got more, I just learned it today that uh, my appeal to the FBI came back and said, well, yeah, we found some more information uh, about uh, Joseph Papp and uh, we'll respond to you in our appeal. Um, so I'll wait probably another six months before I get back a big stack. Uh, Feynman's FBI file stops in 1960. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that's past 1960, which you can't have access to yet. And so I've appealed Feynman's FBI file as well. But anyway, Pap is a whack job. You know, he's paranoid, he's a conniver, he, he's genius, he's um, he, he a workaholic. Uh, he's, he's basically bipolar with Munchausen syndrome. He shot himself in the shoulder one time. He, he doesn't believe anybody. He's secretive in many different ways. And he was so secretive and weird that he drove his wife over the edge. And his wife freaked out and basically slit his daughter's wrists and tried to commit suicide to herself. Um, and you know, I interviewed Gary Zabo, who was, was there at the time, um, basically lived that. And he, Pap died in 89. Uh, left a huge probate issues, $5 million in IRS back taxes, um, deceived a bunch of people, and left his family penniless. So that's the part that was probably disturbing. The, the, but nevertheless, I think he really had something. So um, the question is, how does this work? And so I looked at these various data sources, the patents, the interviews, all, everything I could find. And so what I, I think is this ionized noble gas soup seems to be a key component. This 27.1 megahertz RF frequency, which does uh, enhancement of the um, ionization. Uh, reversible chlorine and hydrogen reaction, which is documented in gaseous photochlorination books and other uh, science. Sparks and magnetic fields, sparks, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, electrolysis, maybe that's a little HHO involvement. Radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, and then deoxygenated water, which he uses and mentions in the patents. So there's, there's some interesting soup of, of, of ideas here that could be figured out, hopefully. Um, but anyway, in essence, this is oscillating pressure of you compress it all, and the hydrogen and the chlorine gas uh, become very explosive when you hit them with UV light. And they come down, and then they, they have a very slow reaction, and they come back. Uh, and so that's very well understood and written up. 
There's also the dynamometer test, the only real um, uh, sort of proof that PAP did anything real. You know, they, they had this test, uh, 776 foot-pounds of torque, 107 horsepower, very torquey engine. Normally, you know, engines are like one-to-one -one horsepower to torque, but this is seven-to-one. Uh, is this faked? Maybe. I don't think so. Um, but anyway, this, there's some of the mixtures of the chlorine gas, and the mixtures change with time, uh, depending upon which patent. There's three patents related to this. Chlorine gas and UV light explode, it, not just like normal combustion where things explode sort of serially. It's the speed of light. It goes across all of the atoms, and kaboom, the whole thing explodes in a very vicious and, and manner. Uh, gaseous fluorochlorination is a great book. Um, there's a chapter all about uh, shows propagation of hydrogen atoms can track, um, can, can go back and forth. So with sharply defined explosion limits, which I mentioned. Uh, and there's other articles on, on explosion of hydrogen and oxygen and chlorine, because you have these two electrodes creating some hydrogen and oxygen and the chlorine gas, and then they explode. There's, the Russians did an interesting article uh, in 1956 on the thermal reaction of chlorine and hydrogen, which is a uh, translation. And, but there seems to be a lot of science around this time that PAP would have been absorbed into and, and sucked into. Um, there's a, here's a word cloud, which I can email to somebody about. You take the patent and run it through a word cloud and see all the various ideas that come up. Uh, and it talks specifically about various gases and chlorine states and so forth. Um, There's a South African patent in 1981 which changes the noble gas mix a little bit and each gas is ionized separately and these added coils and magnetic fields to this. So there's a lot of different elements that need to be studied. Uh, could this be, you know, Ken Shoulder's work where, you know, you have this high performance spark going across at the top of when everything is compressed. Could that be an explanation? Um, as to how he's getting excess energy out of this. Uh, I, I also did a remote viewing with Joe McMonagle. How many people have heard of Joe McMonagle before? Okay, many people. So I sent him this, our, this envelope with JP2083, which happens to be Joe Pap2083, it's his social security number. And, and I said, well, you know, when's the first discovery of this? What is the secret to making the fuel? Is it in the classified world? What's the best fuel today? You know, does it tap the ZPE? How does this work? And, and he's still working on this, but some of the preliminary responses um, came back like this. He said it's a chemical concoction, hydrogenation of different molecular components in this torus coplanar. You can sort of read the rest of it. And he drew an embodiment of a gas turbine ramjet that's just normal air breathing, but at the end you inject a special additive fuel to make it go better. We're still getting more data about uh, what's this, you know, how, how does it really work? And from, from an intuitive point of view. Um, so what's next really is we're looking at more investigations. I keep digging in with the, the, the various science elements of what I can discover and the witnesses and people that were around that saw this. Uh, and so if I was to say, well, what should you really do next? And this is what I would do is I'd go spend 750K to go continue doing more research and experiment design and, and get the people together. So would, my estimate, a year, 750K. Uh, so the reasons that you'd go on and go do this is that there's something real here. The explosions, I don't think, can be faked. There really is anomalous big energy repeated several times. There seems to be a reduction to practice with a proven dynamometer test. Um, the proof is doable. You can recreate this or make a smaller scale and try to uh, work through it all. Um, I think the risk of a null result is very low because you've already seen that this can work. And then it's got, of course, civilization changing potential, which is why we're all, all here, and then low capital outlay, and then the return on investment is, is astronomical. So th those are the sort of concluding marks and, and pitch, really, for why you might want to push at this. And now, if anybody's got a $750,000 check, I'm sure you can focus on many different choices at this conference t today to where you would put your money. So. Uh, with, with that comment, let me just go right to questions.
Did I make it in 20 minutes? Yeah, OK. Yes, fascinating. Um, 750K sounds like a lot, but it's actually a very small fraction of the amount of money that's been spent, both given to Joe and the people that have uh, followed on. I, I think yes. it's 20 or $30 million. Right, I think closer to $30 million is what I've heard, yeah. poured down this hole. Um, you have a special insight or? or, or well, the special insight is, um, no, everybody has failed to do the science that this room would love to see. Is what, what we've had is experimenters and entrepreneurs and no classically trained scientists that would go plug at this and, and work at it in an honest way. Uh, so that, I guess that's the answer to my question or your question. Did that do it for you or? Uh, Not really, okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's another question. Thank you. Um, fascinating historical development, but I'm totally confused. I, I, is it an engine? And if it's an engine, what does it do? Does it, does it produce more, more energy than it, you put into it? I, yeah, yes, it's, it's an engine, a fuelless engine. You feed it no fuel, you inject no fuel. the gases in it, it runs perpetually and generates work. Okay, that, that's what I thought you were going to say. Yeah. Right, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I'm not clear about the role of the noble gases in it. Can you say something about what they do? That, that's a great question. I, I'm not sure of the role either, other than the maybe they're, they're ionized um, to different levels. Uh, maybe they, I, I'm just speculating. I don't have an answer there, but that's what's written up in the patent. And it seems to be the other replicators have ignored the, the thorium 2% electrodes and just, and the chlorine gas and have just focused on this noble gas soup with sparks. And, that's sort of how the third parties have taken this, rather than what Pap originally described in his patents. Have you considered the possibility, uh, given that Pap was so paranoid and secretive, that one of the reasons efforts hitherto to replicate has failed is that he didn't include all of the actual information in his patents? Uh, y yes, I think that's, um, that's accurate, but I think the first patent is the most interesting and honest. And I, um, I filed for the original patent application, and there's some interesting changes in that versus what was actually published. So divining the truth out of those patents is, uh, I guess, a challenge. And don't have a clean answer for you. Um, but I, he wanted to protect what he had. I think so. It's honest that he would say, these are the ranges and gases that he, I want to use. I want to try to protect some of this. He seemed to be much more free with the mechanics of the engine rather than the secret sauce of the fuel. Lady behind you. Is there any is there any sense that any of this is in use um, with the U.S. military as a secret technology or some other group? The the only testimony that I have for that is my friend Ron, who said there's something in between chemical and nuclear, and that's not really demonstrative. But the answer should come back, and we'll keep exploring that potential? I, my gut says yes. Um, Ryan, yes. Um, you said that PAP died in 1989, I believe it was. Yes. And I'm wondering if in your research and digging into so many things, which I highly commend, um, did you check into the, to see after he died, what became of his papers? Because if he had some secretive 
information that he may have kept out of the patent, as uh, York suggested, um, and which he may very well have. He might have had it in his papers, that which may have been able to be retrieved after he died. Yeah, that, that's a great story over lunch. Yeah, his, his, the IRS came in and bonded everything in his garage or wherever he had it, and then the, the, the area was broken into later on. Um, and there was a police reports filed for this, and many people have been after that exact thing. Uh, there are many caches of original papers and documents spread around. Uh, Zabo Jr. has some, Klosterman has some, Rohner has some. It, it's scattered to the wind. I think the answer is it's not there. It's in his head. That's, uh, I think, the truth. Do we use up the five minutes? Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you.